Thanks, Jake, for the uh, introduction and Aurora for chairing this session. And I agree, this is an outstanding topic, uh, and it's been covered a couple of times elsewhere, but hopefully we'll put a different slant on this. And I've been charged with talking about the impact of obesity on surgical options for hiatal hernia repair. These are my disclosures, none of which are pertinent to this talk. So the goals of my talk are to identify candidates for hernia repair with specific attention to the impact of obesity in these patients, to describe the outcomes of reconstruction, and at the time of hernia repair, what sort of additional surgical intervention should take place, uh, a typical anti-reflux procedure such as fundoplication and iterations of that versus metabolic surgery. <clears throat> So I want to frame the discussion a bit because GERD and hiatal hernia repair go hand in hand. And it's critical that we understand the difference between what is a physiologic problem, such as GERD, versus an anatomic abnormality, which is hiatal hernia. Uh, it's hard to parcel these apart, and I think that any conversation should include both of these because these are goals. And when we talk about anti-reflux surgery, we're trying to offer a cure for symptoms and potentially disease progression. Now, with any anti-reflux and anti-GERD and hernia repair, it's critical that we make the right selection in terms of patients and decision making, and this includes preoperative evaluation as well as surgical technique. And in order to make these right decisions, we have to understand the pathophysiology, not just of hernia, but of GERD. And this is a complex interaction, and this is critical prior to either uh, anti-reflux surgery or for bariatric surgery. So it's some interplay of an incompetent lower esophageal sphincter, potentially esophageal dysmotility, which has to be accounted for, mechanical problems like hiatal hernia, and then potentially functional problems like uh, delayed gastric emptying as well. And for patients that come in with typical symptoms, of course, these are the best responders, but they have some amalgam of these sorts of complaints, and these can be addressed by anti-reflux surgery and hiatal hernia repair. But that's the physiologic uh, uh, spectrum of GERD, but parasophageal hernia may actually not include GERD symptoms, and often it doesn't. These patients present differently. These are mechanical problems. Anemia from Cameron's lesions, shortness of breath if the, the stomach is herniated into the left chest, chest pain, nausea, vomiting, dysphagia, and of course we're trying to prevent strangulation and obstruction because these have high uh, morbidity and mortality. So the workup for hiatal hernia typically will include fluoroscopy and upper endoscopy. These are complementary because fluoroscopy will give you an understanding of anatomy. EGD will allow you to evaluate for uh, mucosal anomalies. And then depending on patients, you may also include these other studies like CT, manometry, pH, or an emptying study. But these are often not necessary in a patient with mechanical symptoms from hiatal hernia. The principles of repair, regardless of reconstruction, are, are pretty established and include esophageal mobilization to allow for an appropriate length of intra-abdominal esophagus, sac excision, uh, crural repair with or without reinforcement, and then some sort of procedure afterwards, typically or not, uh, and this will be dependent on length of intra-abdominal esophagus, presence of uh, Barrett's epithelium or obesity, and that's what I'm really going to focus on today. So obesity is a risk factor for GERD, and patients with severe obesity, BMI greater than 40, upwards of half of those patients have GERD. Hiatal hernia is associated with obesity, ranging from 15 to 50 percent of patients with varying degrees of obesity from uh, BMI 30 and upwards, and this is probably a phenomenon at least partly related to increased intra-abdominal pressure. And we know that as BMI uh, goes up, the likelihood of patients having GERD increases as well, probably secondary to intra-abdominal pressure. And if we look a little more carefully at this, it's probably a function of an increased rate of transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation in patients with obesity, uh, and the pressure gradient across the LDS is higher for these patients as well, so they're more likely to have reflux and hernia. 
Additionally, silent GERD exists uh, in patients with obesity as well. Undetected reflux may be due to decreased esophageal sensitivity in patients who are chronic refluxers, and this tends to occur more commonly in patients with obesity, and there's poor correlation between symptoms, uh, severity, and objective reflux as well. <clears throat> We know that laparoscopic Nissen fund application is a tried and true intervention for uh, uh, GERD, and the outcomes uh, are well established in multiple trials. But in patients with obesity, the long-term effectiveness um, has been questioned. And the definition of, of obesity ranges based on BMI, but data, even in patients with a BMI of greater than 30, has demonstrated that uh, there are higher failure rates of fund application of every iteration based on persistent increase in intra-abdominal pressure. And we also know that these operations are technically more challenging as well. Patients with obesity have significant torque on the abdominal wall during the course of the operation. They may have increased visceral fat, uh, making uh, dissection of the esophagus and repair more challenging. So if we look at anti-reflux procedures, probably the best anti-reflux procedure, not even necessarily for weight loss, is a rule y reconstruction. Physiologically, why is this? It's a low pressure, small gastric pouch. So if there's any motility problems, it circumvents this because it empties by gravity. It excludes the parietal cell mass of the fundus and body, which results in decreased acid production. And in a rule limb that's long enough, it will be no bile reflux. And GERD in the setting of rule y gastric bypass has high rates of resolution, decreased use of anti-secretory medication, improvement of quality of life, and importantly, decreased objective physiologic acid exposure. So I just want to review some of the data that exists. This is a study looking at the BOLD database, looking at rule y gastric bypass as the best resolution of GERD, and this is probably a weight loss dependent effect. This is a study looking at comparative objective outcomes following Nissen versus gastric bypass in patients with uh, obesity and also GERD, with equivalent objective results in, for Nissen versus bypass, but of course the additional benefit of resolution of comorbidities related to weight as well. And this study looked at anatomic findings and outcomes after anti-reflux procedures in patients with obesity undergoing conversion to rule y gastric bypass. So often a rule y gastric bypass is a salvage procedure for failed Nissen in patients who have GERD uh, after anti-reflux procedure in severe obesity. And the authors of this study found that there was a high rate of RAP disruption transhiatal uh, migration of the RAP and an overall low rate of intact RAPs overall. And one of our speakers today published this study looking at laparoscopic fund application versus gastric bypass in patients with GERD. In hospital morbidity for fund application uh, versus gastric bypass for GERD uh, was similar fund application patients in general were healthier. But interestingly, laparoscopic rule gastric bypass actually had fewer in hospital complications. So there may be some speculation that doing a rule gastric bypass versus Nissen fund application may carry more morbidity, but this isn't necessarily true. But this was a short term study, and we do know that the long term implications of rule gastric bypass does exhibit some sort of long term complication as well. This is a study from our group at Cleveland Clinic uh, looking at the incidence of hiatal hernia technical feasibility during bariatric surgery. So this was a series of 80 patients, two-thirds of which underwent rheumatoid -like gast gastric bypass, one-third of whom had uh, sleeve gastrectomy. This was either a pre-op diagnosis or intraoperative diagnosis. Definition was a hernia greater than five centimeters. And we showed that uh, overall uh, outcomes were similar to primary bariatric operations uh, without hernia repair with a slight increase in time and significant reduction both in terms of GERD quality of life as well as weight loss and comorbidity outcomes. There's a more recent study looking at uh, concurrent bariatric surgery and parasophageal hernia repair uh, based on the MBCA QIP group. So this is over 200,000 procedures uh, of bariatric surgery done without hernia repair and 40,000 uh, parasophageal hernias done simultaneously with a one-to-one -one propensity matching for sex. No difference in 30-day major complications, 3.5 versus 3.4%. And they conclude the safety of concurrent repair of parasophageal with bariatric surgery is, uh, is is reasonable. So we know that GERD resolves with rule gastric bypass, and the compelling statement that I want to make 
is that in addition to GERD resolution rates, which range from 70 to 100 percent, we have to look at dyslipidemia, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and metabolic syndrome, and diabetes, because all of these impact not just GERD-related quality of life metrics, but overall mortality, and this is incredibly compelling. So. Clearly, metabolic surgery has additional impact in terms of uh, resolution of GERD, but also weight-related comorbidities. Sleeve gastrectomy is the most commonly performed operation worldwide. There's conflicting data on GERD. A tubularized stomach is likely refluxogenic, and there's a risk of Barrett's. I'm going to touch on this briefly. Ruin y gastric bypass, the physiologic mechanism of a low pressure, uh, easily emptying pouch that excludes uh, parietal cells is compelling, as well as bile reflux. But there are potential long term complications of ruin y gastric bypass as well. So this is a systematic review and meta-analysis of GERD and sleeve versus Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, comparing new onset, worsened, or improved symptoms. Roux-en-Y gastric bypass has a better effect on GERD, and Roux-en-Y gastric bypass uh, has a low onset of GERD, onset of GERD afterwards, and is a more effective treatment versus sleeve gastrectomy. This is the SM Boss trial, which many of you have probably seen over the course of this meeting, which is a multi-center randomized control trial looking at Roux-en-Y gastric bypass versus sleeve gastrectomy. Weight loss and diabetes resolution were the main outcomes of this, but in the sleeve and gastric bypass cohort, the rates of GERD were similar. But if you look at the remission rates of sleeve gastrectomy versus Roux-en-Y gastric bypass, clearly Roux-en-Y gastric bypass is better. But the problem with this very well-constructed study is that a third of the patients who underwent sleeve either had worsened symptoms or de novo reflux. So this is a problem with sleeve gastrectomy. This is a, a, a recent uh, study, retrospective cohort study of the nationwide insurance claims data, 2,000 patients who underwent metabolic surgery and hiatal hernia repair, <clears throat> and they looked at sleeve gastrectomy versus ruin or gastric bypass and hernia repair concurrent versus sleeve or gastric bypass alone. Three-year follow-up evaluated at one and three-year intervals. So sleeve gastrectomy and hiatal hernia repair in this large insurance claims data study is more likely to have additional operation and endoscopy not bariatric conversion or revision, but an additional operation and endoscopic intervention versus rheumatoid gastric bypass and hernia repair, which was associated with increased endoscopy, but not an additional abdominal operation and not uh, a conversion. So there is accruing data of sleeve gastrectomy uh, and potential long-term sequela of reflux. This is a 10-year plus study of small group of patients, 50, but 45% of these patients developed a de novo hiatal hernia. Now, grant that it's just 20 of those patients who underwent EGD, but ultimately a significant portion of these patients underwent conversion to rural and gastric bypass. Barrett's metaplasia developed in 15% of these patients, non-dysplastic, and patients with reflux were more likely to have de novo hiatal hernia after sleeve gastrectomy. And this is the, the JNCO study, uh, which highlights the importance of doing upper endoscopy after sleeve gastrectomy, 110 patients after sleeve, mean 58-month follow-up, PPI use increased from pre-op, 57 versus 19 percent, and all these patients underwent uh, routine upper endoscopy with a high rate of bile reflux. Admittedly, their definition of upward migration of Z-line is a little confusing, but I think this is a, a proxy for hernia. The critical and most important part of this study is that 17 percent of these patients developed de novo non-dysplastic Barrett's. <clears throat> Barrett's regression has been shown in case reports in small uh, uh, single center studies to potentially regress after ruin my gastric bypass, and this is probably a combined effect of both acid and bile diversion. So in conclusion, uh, patients with obesity uh, and hiatal hernia, uh, in patients with obesity, hiatal hernia and GERD are exceedingly common. Hiatal hernia repair and fund application may have inferior uh, results compared to metabolic surgery, but this has to be taken in the context of not just physiologic acid reflux, but anatomic correction, decreased intra-abdominal pressure, and resolution of weight-related comorbid disease. Laparoscopic wound wide gastric bypass creates a low pressure system that minimizes acid production because those parietal cells are separated. And there's very little bile reflux as long as that rule limb is long enough. 
And I think most important and most compelling is this addresses not only GERD, but metabolic diseases associated with obesity and long-term morbidity and mortality. Thank you very much for your attention, and it's a pleasure to be here today.